the system is supposed to be uh, this, this is supposed to be always <laughs> if uh, an ohm automation I'm going to forget my writing uh, let's call it the JSM based ohm automation let's call it uh, the JSM And so, as some of them said, the project should be. So, the intent is first, we mean that the system is supposed to be GSM operated. If it's not GSM operated, then it, there's no way it's going to be able to carry out uh, the operation of uh, receiving SMS or sending SMS or the operation of receiving a call or even calling. And it's supposed to be two channels. So, two channels will mean that we have two, two states or two control points. For the Channels, I was decided to use two bulbs as against living a, a, a socket point where you can just plug, uh, say, maybe a uh, motor socket to and then, and then get the things connected to. It's easier to actually test this. This is more like an indicator. You can see if it comes on, if it goes on, if it comes on, if it goes on. So that's, that's important. So it is the design. Okay. A uh, few things we said the system should be able to do. Let, let's list them so we have them written out and then we can then begin to actually discuss in that light. We said uh, it's just a motivation, but we said that the control should be DTMA. We said that the mode of control should be DTMA. That's the mode of control. Or mode of, mode of control. When I mean the control now, that's for the channel. It is possible to turn on or off any of those channels using text message. So which means you send an SMS to say, oh, turn on channel one, turn on channel two, or either way you intend or you choose to actually send the, uh, the code, but via SMS. It's also possible to call, and which means say, oh, when I call with this number, turn on that channel, if I call with a different number, turn on this channel. So you're gonna have two, phone, two different phone numbers. I mean, to control in different channels. That's also very, very possible. But this time, the call, which is the DTMA aspect of it, the call, which of course, I mean, the DTMA, which is via call, happens, uh, happens, uh, happens does. You call the modem, I mean, you call the Jesse modem in the device, and then it uh, answers the call, I mean, which means uh, it, just, it sees the call, it picks the call, or, or hands up, but the pixel call and then wait for you to send it the detail. What the detail means is we explain as well as you continue. But the mode of control is primarily via detail. Via call. And as we said, you should be able to do is that we said it's two channels to discuss that it's two channels. So we have uh, uh, channel one and channel two. We said the system should be able to actually, we should be able to query the system. So we should be able to ask the state of the channel. So we should be able to request the state of the channels. Which means when you send a request code, this time, the request code should be sent via SMS now. So when you send an SMS in an order that the system knows, it should be able to tell you the state of channel one and the state of channel two. And as we said, the system should be able to do this. The system should be able to add admin. We should be able to add uh, users. We should be able to add users. Now, this time, we're not adding users. We're actually adding admins. Because only the admins will be able to actually carry out some of this. We should be able to add admins. And 
we link the system with five maximum ideas. This operation is done via SMS. We also should be able to remove or delete admins. This process too is via SMS. Another we said we should be able to do is we should be able to get feedback from the system. The feedback should also come in the form of SMS. Then there was there is last thing we said we should have to push uh, um, uh, and get to work on. We said uh, the DTF that we are sending should be of four digits. You remember? We said the DTF thing we are sending should be of four digits. I don't need to work on, the, on one digit for now. We will see as we do it. Let's just get started first. One digit. So let me explain uh, briefly, and then before we get into, into the technical aspect of it. Don't forget, it's a GSM automation device that uh, gets operated via SMS and call. Firstly, that when the system is turned on, there is no admin. And then, but to add an admin, we should be able to, uh, via SMS, add admin. And we said we want to be able to add up to five admins. Those admins are going to be the only persons who can call the system and carry out all of and I mean carry out all of the operations within the system. What are those operations? You should be able to call the system. The system should be able to actually verify you as an administrator, which means you must have been added as an admin. And then you can then send the four digit code either to one of the any of the channels or to off any of the channels. Two channels. Only an admin can have other users. So which means you can add administrator one and so three, four and five. You can also remove administrators. Other way to remove an administrator will be to just actually say delete an admin, which you can do. Alternatively, alternatively, you can replace another phone number with a particular person. So, which means, oh, you had my number as an admin before, you can just replace my number. That's another way of just deleting the user. But for any of these operations, we want to be able to get feedback. So, which means, every time I had anybody as an administrator, I want to get feedback via SMS. Of rules was added or the operation that I just carried out. When an admin is replaced or, re or removed, we want to know via SMS. When an admin is added, we want to know. Uh, when we request for the state of the channels, we want to know is this is channel one. I mean, look at the number you gave. I turned on the system, I left my house and I went to work. And I'm at work, I'm not sure if the system is on or off. Just to be sure. I send an SMS via query in query in the system and the same response to me via SMS and tells me, oh, this channel is on, this channel is off. If I don't want that particular channel that he has told me is on, on, then I can just turn it off via SMS too. How do I do that? Now, this time you're not turning it off via SMS, you are turning it off via what? Via call. Which means you call the system, it receives the call, and then you send specific uh, DTM to, and then the system then operates. This makes sense, Abi? One other thing I added to the system, which I didn't tell you, should tell you now. The system has memory. And when I mean memory, I mean it can recall. I added a recall to it. The truth is, and this will actually save, save uh, the user quite a lot of uh, stress and the cost of operating the system. Now explain. I think I just go to right now, and one of the channels is my fan, and I turned it on, and then I went to bed to sleep, and within the night, light was taken off, and then maybe a few minutes after, light was restored. The system would be expecting me to get up, spend the same amount I was spent in calling it, and sending it this digit, this four digit in DTMF tones, before it can turn on that channel again. You, you do get it. So which means, if light keeps going on and on, like 10 times before daybreak, you have to be calling it that number of times. That would be too much. So what I've done, I've elevated that. I've added memory now, where the system can recall. 
So if the system was on before it went off, when it resumes at power, it can recall what state it was and then return itself to that state. So that way, you wouldn't have to wake up to carry out the same action you just asked it to do. I, I thought you would like it. That's why I added it. Such that, if eventually, but the implication here also is this. If you left it on, and when it never took light before you left the house, and you went to work, and you left the house, if it never brings back light, and it's still on, it will recall and remember who I was on the last time, and it turned itself on. So the, the good part about that, of course, the solution to that is that, since you can always request for channel states, you just need to remember. And whenever you remember, all you simply need to do is send an SMS in the, in the pattern that it should be sent, the question for the state of those channels. And then you can then tell whether a channel is on or off, and then, then this time, turn it off. So that whether light is restored or brought back 300 times within, I mean, while you are absent, the channels remains off. Does it make sense? Yeah. You understand that? Yeah. Okay. So these are all the things the service will be doing, and all of these operations are what we are going to be discussing. Can we continue? Yes. Uh, we already have the book, we've tested it, and, and it's fine. Okay. Before system design, or before we we'll begin to discuss all of the properties as regards how the system should be created, first we need to understand a block diagram, how the system should flow. In discussing that, this was your block diagram should look those. You should have a power supply section. Okay, power supply section. The next very quick session that you should have is your mouth controller session. Now, when I mean sessions, now block. These there are circuitries, there are several electronic circuitries that forms the power supply. There are circuitries that form the power controller uh, session itself. Uh, we are going to need a GSM module. So we're going to need a GSM module. This time a same, a same module. And this will be connected to the system. Uh, we have indicators connected to the system. We have an indicator. We have uh, we have uh, uh, we have a relay that controls channel one. We have currently one relay two that controls our channel two. Uh, what else do we have there? Let me see. So the way it is, the power supply feeds uh, this module. Uh, the power supply feeds all of this. It feeds the display, it feeds the channel one, it feeds the channel two, it feeds the indicator, it feeds the relay. All of that needs to feed this module for the relay and actually feed the channel. So this is what your block diagram you uses. So these blocks, uh, if it's possible, you can always snap, snap them. You don't have a video, you can always snap them so that uh, can go as quick as possible. So these blocks are what we are going to explain. And in explaining this block, we'll have ended up explaining the full circuit diagram itself, which I have already sent to you. So let's begin with the pass of that. Before you begin considering whatever is it, or how your system is supposed to be designed. The first thing you need, many times you need to actually have to for is your power supply. And to have a power supply, you need to know all of the power requirements that this system needs, such that you can design your power supply the best way to actually meet those needs. For instance, if I have, uh, if I had, uh, if I have kids at home, 
and I know one needs uh, biscuits, the other one needs uh, um, a soft drink, the other one needs water. If I need to provide for them, it means I need to take into cognizance the need of those three persons. And I, you, you get my point now. So also, before you can begin to discuss your past of life, you need to be able to actually know what the power requirements for all of these needles are. And make sure that your power supply can actually what, provide it. First of all, understand that the symbol we are using is called SIM 800L. SIM 800L. And it operates at between 3.4 volts to between 4.3 volts. It requires this voltage at around 2 amps. Now, don't worry about all of this information. I mean, these informations are important, but don't, don't worry about how I got them. There is a manufacturer data sheet that explains all of this, and I'm going to give you all of those materials before you leave today. So there is a data sheet for this same model, and the manufacturer has told us that this same model will require between 3.4 volts to 4.3 volts at 2 amps for it to actually be functional operational. The map plan that we are using is the PIC 18F2620. And Manfred has told us that it requires just 5 volts at 25 million per pin. Can I continue? Yes. Our display requires 502 DC. All of these voltages are DC. The indicator requires just 2 volts at between uh, less than 10 million actually. Can I continue? The relay that we have gotten, we're going to discuss relay. We're going to talk about it in this class. The relay that we have gotten operates using two voltages. And I explain why. But understand that the coil of the relay for the particular for this particular project we're doing operates at 5 volt DC. That is coil, the coil of each of the relay. But its contacts. I just said the relay has coils and contacts. We'll talk about the relay. Is contact actually being used to switch 220 volts live and neutral? We'll get there. So, on the relay, understand the relay, it's coil, it's 5 volts coil. It can stand, I mean, the relay itself that we're using can understand a maximum of 10 amps, the AC. But its contacts are actually used to switch. 220 volt AC, live and neutral. Same as relay 2 and the channel 2. So if you look at this alone, it means our power supply should be able to provide us 220 volt AC, should also be able to provide us between 3.4 to 4.3 volts, should be able to provide us this too. Between 3.4 to 4.3 volts DC. It should also be able to provide us 5 volts for our controller. The light emitting diode or the indicator gets its voltage from the uh, from the power controller. So if the power controller has gotten 5 volts, this indicator will get its 2 volts. Through a resistor from the controller. We'll explain that to where we get to that. But in explaining our power supply, hope I'm not too fast. No, no, no. In explaining the power supply, what you just need to know that power supply should be able to actually supply us or make available to us this range of voltages 220 volt AC, 3.3 volts between 3.3 to 4.3 volt DC, and 5 volt DC. That's what our power supply should be able to provide us. Why is that? So if Power supply. If the micro um, all this led the indicator, the, the relays and the same one, they are they are power supply from the microcontroller. Not from the microcontroller. I said the indicator. 
just just say you can yes oh, guess okay. his own voltage from the power controller okay. through a resistor okay. 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 but the rest of it gets their supply from or get power from the power supply interestingly if the power supply, if the power controller does not get five volts from the supply there is no way it would be able to make two volts available to the indicator so eventually you realize that even the voltages that are gotten or derived from power controllers are voltages that are made available by the supply itself. Or you didn't take the, the, the power for the display and the No, the, the display is 5 volts. Like when we were doing that calculation, you know, yes, it's the, yes, 5 volts. I thought if that 5 volts was for the microcontroller itself. Yes, if 5 volts are available to the microcontroller, then the 5 volts can also be available to the display. The fiber can also be available to the relays. Okay. I'll explain all of that. How how the mid available was done. Can we continue? Yeah. Alright. So I'm gonna play this side of the board. Um, yeah, this side of the board. You have this block already, don't you? Yes, yes. Okay. You have the block? Okay. Alright. So, from that, I will be asking for the block so I know what else to talk about. Let's take the power supply first. Since uh, while we're having our interaction on how the project should go, we have discussed that the channels are supposed to be AC power. The channels are supposed to be AC power. In doing that, I knew already that we're going to need an AC source. So which means our power supply first should be such that should have an AC source that's life and neutral. So these are our source. And that source is going through where? This plug. Does that make sense? Because with this plug, all you simply need to do is connect this to any 220 volt AC point and then make voltage available to the system. It makes sense? Yes. Yeah. So which means there needs to be a source. There needs to be a source, a 220 volt source. That source could be from your generator. That source could be from your PC and network, like we have now. There needs to be a source. Such that for the parts of the relays contact that requires 220, either life or neutral, it just comes and does those words, get it from the source. Does that make sense? Yeah. You get it now? That's first. Now, since AC is already introduced into the system, and primarily a lot of the other voltages that we buy are DCs, there's no point bringing in a battery anymore. Because from the AC, we can deduce DC. So, what we just did simply was bringing a transformer. We brought in a main step down transformer. So we call this the mains step down transformer. Now, in choosing a transformer itself, we needed to be mindful of the current that's going to be required. By, don't forget, I told you the same volume requires is only uh, 3, uh, 3.4 to 4.3 volt at 2 amps. What it means is this if you sum up all of the current that are going to be needed by all of the different components, your transformer should be able to provide that current. If your transformer cannot provide that current, then the current is going to be, is, 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 I mean, it's, it's going to be needed and will be needed. And if it's found not available, then that particular model, modem or device or system that requires it goes off. It's like, uh, I don't know if you've seen those houses where there is a water reservoir and for one reason or the other, maybe the, a pipe that leads to one of the flats is blocked and water cannot get there. Now, the issue is not because water is not available in the reservoir, it's because it's blocked. Now imagine if there's no water in the reservoir and it's not blocked and then you just get the tap and open and you can't get water. Do you understand? So that's what it will mean. If all of the components that requires different amount of current sum together, where the transformer cannot actually account for it, 
Now, if you look at it, or we just by physical observation, we have already said that this C model alone requires current at 2 amps. It means whatever transformer we need to go and get in the market should be able to supply above what? 2 amps, or at least 2 amps. In our search, we, took, we could only get a 15 volt transformer at what amp now? 2 amps. So we've got a main transformer, 15 volt AC at 2 amps. That's what we got. What it means is that when 220 comes to the transformer, the transformer step that voltage down to 15 volts AC. Now we don't need the 15 volts AC. We need DC voltage. So we brought in something called a bridge rectifier. I'm sure you have heard of all of this before. Yes. So what the bridge rectifier simply does is convert this AC to DC for us. So that at this point we now have DC voltage. At this point, we have AC. So this is going to be the positive side of the voltage and the negative side of the voltage. Can I continue? Now, I fear that this 50 volts, if you look at the, the, the maximum DC voltage we require, is what? It's 5. This is 15. I needed a way to first of all drop this DC voltage. If you follow me, sir? Yeah. So what I did was I got something called a voltage regulator. I got something called what? A voltage regulator. We got a 9 volt voltage regulator. So we call it 7809. What our voltage regulator did for us was drop the 15 volt that comes in. Of course, it's not 15 volt that comes in. What comes in is actually 15 minus 1.2, which is going to be what? 13.8. So what you have here is 13.8 volt DC. That's what we get here. The reason we are getting 13.8 volts here is because the rectifier, the, the diodes that we are actually using, the diode we use here is the one hand 5408. This diode is a rectifying diode that can allow up to 3 amps to flow through it. Hope all of these information are not too much. They are getting too much, have you? <laughs> What should we do? No, no, let's go. You should go on, Abby. Yes. No, I'm, I'm making the video available to you. So you just pick out the, the, the things you want to talk about, and then you can always, always, always do whatever with the rest. What about? <laughs> okay, can we continue? Yes. Alright. Oh, I'm not making it too, te too technical. I just thought to just discuss some of these things yeah, and then. I can continue. Yes. Thank you. I'm sorry, but but if you do not want me to, I will just leave it that. <laughs> so the the diode that we're actually using here is one hundred fifty four eight can allow three amps. Uh, because the diode has what we call potential here. The diode has a potential yield of zero point six volts since it's made of silicon. And then we have two that takes care of the positive swing of the, the AC and two that takes care of the negative swing of the, of the, of the AC if you have 0 0.6 times 2, you're going to have 1.2 volts if you take 1.2 volts from the 15 volts that is coming you have 13.8 volts left entering the input of the voltage regulator this is its common and this is its output Does it make sense? Yes. How about you? Alright. Now, don't forget, it is not 9 volts that I'm looking for. What I need is 5 volts. But I have to explain to you how I arrived at my 5 volts. Interestingly, something else as you see. This voltage regulator will not supply this 9 volts outside one hand. And I needed up to two hands out there. 
So what I did was I had two of these voltage regulator in parallel. So that why this one can handle one hand, I just have another one. I know it's a, it's a very lame way to do it, but it was an afterthought. And I'll explain why later, yeah? but off the camera. So <laughs> they come down. Then I had the output of the joint here. So when this one produces one hand, this one produces one hand, but I eventually have here is going to load two amps at nine volts. Can I continue? This output was now sent through a switch into another voltage regulator. But this time, a 5 volt voltage regulator. So there's a switch. And into the input of this voltage regulator is a capacitor to filter the ripple, the AC component in this DC. I used a 1000 microfarad 25 volt electrolytic capacitor. Don't worry. When you begin to uh, listen back to this clip, it will make to make some sense. Interestingly, your supervisor might just like the idea that someone is just explaining this thing into two, into two, into two. Ah. If extra supervisors are been around and you explain this. Your supervisor will buy you Pepsi at the end of the day. I'll continue. Alright. I'll try and clean this side. So I'm going to use this side of the board. Ashid, hope you are following. Yes. Chris, how about you? Yes, sir. Can I continue? Yes, sir. Interestingly, what I did here, what I did here too, I have two made a video here. And its output filtered also by 100 microfarad 16 bit capacitor. Can we continue? Yes, sir. Now, after I did that, the implication is this any of the devices or component that requires 5 volts can get the 5 volts from here. I have my plus 5 volts here, DC, at this point. My, the negative ray I got in anywhere on this point, on this point, anywhere on this point. Do you understand it? Yeah. And the negative side, which is the negative. The part that requires 220, get the 220 from where? So Life and neutral. Do you get it? So if you look at it, we've made available for this guy, we've made this available too. Who is left? The, either 3.3 to 4.3 volts is what is left. How did we achieve that? Simply, 5 volt is here. I simply send this 5 volt through a diode. This time, I use a 1N, a 1N4007. It's also a rectifying diode. I said that this one can only allow one hand to go through. As against the 1N54A that can allow up to three hours to flow through. Can I continue? Then I sent this into the base of the transistor. This transistor is your TIP 41C. It's actually used as a current amplifier. By the output, the input is corrected so this is So this is my base. This is my collector and this is the meter. The output here now has another capacitor to filter it. For this time, a 100 microfarad at 10 volts. The implication is this. Any of those devices, especially the C module that requires between 3.4 volts to 4.3 volts can source it from this one. 4.3 volts. The implication is if 5 volt is coming in here, 
this diode drops 0 0.6 of it. So 5 minus 0 0.6 will be left with what? Eh? 4.6. 4 4 volts. Isn't it? 4.4. 4. 4. 4. 4. 4. 4. 4. 4. Now, don't forget we said this guy in fact between 3.4 to 4.3. We are sure this diode will do it because voltage regulator will not always give you exactly 5 volts. It's going to give you maybe 4.9, 4.7, 4.8 out. So that when you take 0.6 of it, you are left with around maybe 4.2, 4.3, 4.1, or even 4.0. Does it make sense? Yeah. So this is the power supply. So your GSM module or your C module gets its own voltage at this point. At a current amplification that this TRP forty one C can provide two amps and more, if the transformer can supply it, those that require five volts get five volts at two amps. Those that require two hundred and twenty volt AC get at two hundred and twenty volts from the source. That is how these three required voltage we handle. Does it make sense? Can I go in the box? Mm. Yeah, just snap it so I can just say. Uh, uh, what's the possibility of putting this as part of the report? Yes, you will need it because this is a power supply. I will send it to you. If you look on it, can I continue? It has pins. Let me give you the name of the pins. They will, we just we won't talk about the ones we don't need. We'll talk about only the ones we need. But let me just give you the pin assignment. There is a pin that is called the ring. There is one that is called the DTR. There is one that is called the MICP and the MICN. The other one is called the SPKP, SPKN. We have one that is called the GND. Of course, one called the TXD. The one that is called the RUXD. The one that is called the RUST. I don't know it's called the VCC. Then we have one that's called the NET. NET as an NET. Yes, NET. NET. So I just explain them briefly. At least the one I, 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 I can remember. Can I continue? Yes. Is Chris here? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> the NET is where you actually draw your antenna from. 
Make sure you go to get your, your antenna. Can I continue? Your business is where you supply between 3.4 volts to 4.3 volts DC. That's what you can do. The GND will be the negative of your supply. So this is your supply. 3.4 to 4.3 are you This array is like a, it's your reset button actually. If you connect this place to your ground, the module reset, restarts. Like your reset button. It's your reset button. Or your reset point. And I continue. When this C module is to receive information, it receives information through this pin. This is receivable pin. Now, what is what is to send information to you? It transmits through this point. So, transmit pin. Can I continue? If you, I mean, this is the model. This is the model in question. Is this one? It's called same. I didn't call it the full model. Call it the same one. But when you add other accessories to it, it becomes a phone model. It has speaker. This is the positive side of the speaker. This is the negative part of the speaker. So you can have speaker connected in. You have speaker connected in. So that if you call call it, don't disturb me. With that door, you open that close, please. This is the positive side of the speaker. This is the negative side of the speaker. So that if you if you connect the speaker here, yeah, what happens is if you call it and it receives the call, it can you can I mean, and uh, I'm speaking on my other hand. If the device is here, you can actually hear whatever it is I'm saying to the device or I'm sending to the device via my voice. From a speaker. Do you, 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 you understand this? Yeah. Now, this is microphone point. This pin. This is the positive side of the microphone. This is the inside of the microphone. This is the speaker. You know how the microphone works. What it means is if I put this system here, I mean, why this box is here, and I enable the microphone, I Plug in a microphone, it's having microphone, and I keep it inside. If I call it and it receives the call, whatever is being said within this environment, I can hear on the other hand. So it becomes almost hard as like a spy. Why, if I call it and the speaker enabled in it, whatever I'm saying on the other hand, you that you are here too can hear it. Do you understand it? I don't remember all these details, but this is, is ring pin. This comes on for around 100 milliseconds when the call comes in. It goes high. It turns high when the call comes. Can we continue? And don't forget, it has a SIM slot, a micro SIM slot, where a SIM card can be inserted. It has a micro SIM slot for SIM card. So that's what the same one is. It has an indicator on it too. It has this light and that, that comes on. And uh, when you put the system on, and there's no SIM card in it, it means it cannot connect to any network. You find that LED blinking every second, comes on every second. Goes on and on every second. You see it blinking very fast. The moment it connects to a network, which means there's a SIM card in it, and it has connected to a network, it now blinks once every two seconds. So, if you hung the system and it's open, you can tell when to begin to operate it or not, just by looking at this flashlight. When it has not connected to a network, which means no network yet, it blinks once every second. 
when it has connected to a network, it blinks once in two seconds. So you know it has connected to a network. But now, for the purpose of our own work, I just, I'm sorry I have to just explain uh, this thing. For the purpose of our work, we do not need the speaker part. We do not need it. We do not need the microphone part. We don't even, even we do not even need the ring part of what we want to do. We don't need the reset part either. We don't need it. We need the next, of course. Uh, so long as you are not uh, keeping it in under the ground, it's gonna actually connect to the network, isn't it? But if you want it to have very good network reception too, you can always connect the antenna to that net point. That's the antenna you can connect to. It's optional, actually. Interestingly, I don't even have it connected on your own device. So if you look at it, apart from the micro SIM slot and the SIM card that you're going, we're going to need to be able to supply it negative voltage of the supply and positive voltage at the VCC. That's two pins already. Can I continue? Yeah. And we should be able to actually connect his receive and transmit his line. And of course, I've already told you that his receive line is where when you send it an SMS, the information is sent through. It knows an SMS has, I mean, has, 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 has come into it. When you call it, it also knows through this receive line. And when it also wants to send you information, it sends it through his transmit line out into, into the air. And then it is modulated, and then it goes into the tower, and either way, the call, I mean, the calls or the text message gets to you. Gets to you. Do, you do you get the point? So if you look at it, these four pins were used on the same one. But let me just say this quickly. This quickly. And it's very important. Is receive line connects to the transmit line of your microcontroller. Why is transmit line, are you following this yes. Connects to the receive line of your microcontroller. So you see the way it is. His own microcontroller transmit goes to his own receive. Okay. The microcontroller receive now goes to his own transmit. So the issue is this. I mean, you, you, you can just tell the way it goes. The map controller is where operations actually are carried out. Whether to send a message, to receive a call address. This guy just know. All the same module does is know. It's like a means, like it's, it's a transceiver actually. If I need to send information into the map controller to turn on any of those channels, I send a text message from my phone to this system. Or I send a call, or I make a call from my phone to the same module here. The call is received and is answered. And then this call, can I continue? Yes. Once it's received, and I send the DTML tones, the DTML tone, once received from the, through the same module, I sent through its transport line to receive that on the bank controller. The bank controller can then now look at those code and say, does it match what I'm supposed to receive to one channel one? Does it match what I'm supposed to receive to turn on channel one? Or does it match what I'm supposed to receive to turn on channel two or turn on channel two? Do you get it now? See it as a means between, just a communication, a means of communication between myself and you, in the medium. So I tell the, give the information to the same module, the same module send it to the man controller. The man controller, okay, is it what I want? Is not what I want, and the decision can then be made. Can I continue? Yes. So that's simply it, as it concerns the same module. Can I clear? Yes. What? Other blocks do we have here? The the mouse controller. Uh, okay. We'll take the mouse controller as a bit. For the mouse controller that we're using, as stated before, that it's your PIC 18L2620. That is the name of the mouse controller we're using. This mouse controller we're using has 28 pins. Among these 28 pins are six statutory pins.
six statutory pains. One of those pains is your VDD pain. Another one is your MCLR pain. Another one is your VSS pain. Interestingly, there are two VSS pain in this control. Then you have OSC1 and OSC2. These are the six statutory pains on the mouth control. Let me explain these statutory pains quickly. The VDD is where the plus 5 volt is set to connect the controller. You heard me mention VDD. I mentioned, I heard me mention 5 volts. Yeah. That 5 volts that the mouth controller needs to operate is sent into his VDD pin. His VSS is where the negative of the supply is sent to. So look at what I'm going to do. This is the VSS. This is connected to the negative of the supply. This is the VDD. The VDD is connected to the plus 5 volt of my supply. Does it make sense? Then there's another pin called the MCLR. MCLR stands for Master Clear Reset. It's the reset pin or one of the external reset pin of the mount controller. If you need to reset the mount controller, just take this pin temporarily to the negative of your supply. It will restart the controller. It's like a hard, hard reset. You know the way you always have calculators that have reset button at the back. You just press it and it just reset. So also it's the master clear reset button for the controller. Of course, it also interfaces as your VPP, which I don't want to talk about. It's your voltage, programming voltage pin of the controller. But understand, that is the master clear reset. How is the master clear reset connected? I'll show you. It is connected via a 10 kilo ohms resistor to your VDD. It's connected via a 10 kilo ohms resistor to the VDD. Does it make sense? You understand that? So if you look at it, you're taking out the VDD, you're taking out the VSS, you're taking out the master clear reset. Then there's this other pin, and I told you it has two VSS. So you have one VSS on one side of the one side of the pin, you have another VSS on another side of the pin. The one of the VSS is on your pin X, the other one is on your pin 19. Your master class is on your pin 1, your VDD is on your pin 20 on the controller. Can I continue? Oh, it's not too much. Can I continue? We now have the OSC1 and your OSC2. This OSC1 and your OSC2 is where you connect your auxiliator, the auxiliator pin. The auxiliator pins. Let me explain what I mean by the auxiliator pins to you. For every human being, to actually carry out day-to-day -day activity. We have hearts that pumps blood and takes blood from the body. I mean, that's a place oxygen. So when it pumps the blood, the blood carries oxygen to every part of the body. I mean, that's what biology does. For the mouth controller, the mouth controller requires auxiliation to carry out every bit of instruction it needs to do. If the auxiliator is not there, then it cannot carry out this operation. Can I continue, sir? Without the auxiliator, the controller cannot carry out its operation. So, for us to have the controller, the mouth controller operates well, or operates, we need to actually have an auxiliator to it. The auxiliator we had here, to this point. The auxiliator we had here is a 4 megahertz crystal auxiliary capacitor 
4 megahertz crystal auxiliary capacitor. And on that crystal auxiliary capacitor are 22 pico farad ceramic. No, it's called ceramic kappa capacitor. The essence of the ceramic capacitor is to help start this crystal energy capacitor. And when the crystal energy capacitor starts, it begins to operate. But there is an implication for this crystal energy capacitor. And I'll tell you quickly, I won't waste your time. The mount controller takes one over four of whatever you, you have connected here to carry out this, this instruction. So what it means is that since we have connected four megahertz crystal here, the mount controller just does one all over four of four megahertz. One one. And that leaves is what? One megahertz. So the mount controller actually uses one megahertz as its internal oxidation, not four. But understand that whatever you put here, the controller uses what? One over four of it. So it means if you had there, if you had used eight megahertz here, it should have been one over four of eight. So the mount will have used what? Two megahertz internally. It doesn't have a limit. Its maximum limit is 20 megahertz for this series. So that if you take one over four of 20, that is what? Five megahertz. So each single cycle instruction is carried out at a frequency of what? One megahertz. The inverse of this, you know this frequency? And we say inverse of frequency, which is period, is one all over half. This is going to be one all over one megahertz, which is going to give you one microsecond. That's going to be 0 0.123451. If you do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, this one is going to give you in a second. 0 0.0000001 second. We is same thing as what? Well, 1 microsecond. What it means is this the mouse controller spends 0 0.0000001 second to carry out each single cycle instruction. It's like saying, he does, he can, he, can, he can do a million instructions in one second, or he can do one instruction in one million times in a second. That's the implication. Please, do you understand the analogy? That's the implication of this auxiliary, this crystal you put here. There are some controllers that have internal crystals. This one does not have. So for that purpose, we have to give it an external crystal. And that crystal cannot start itself. These two capacitors, these ceramic capacitors, are what starts this crystal. But when the crystal is started, it can carry on this operation on the inner. And as long as this system is on, it will continue to carry out its operations on in that. These are the statutory pins that will be connected on the microcontroller. Those pins are your pin 9 and your pin 10. So if you look at it, I've told you that your BDD on the controller is on your pin 20, your master clearance is on your pin 1, your VSS is on your pin 8 and 19, and your oscillator and your pin what? 9 and 10. So if you take out this six to three pins from the 28 pin that the IC has, you are left with that many pins. Thank you. So you have 22 input output pins on this model controller. It's a 28 pin IC, but when you take out those six to three pins, you are left with 22 input output pins. Frankly, the board.
Can I continue? Yes. Now, those 22 apple pins are what we now made use of. Those are the input apple pins. And that is how other aspects or other modules or components that we made use of were, I mean, were connected. So let me begin to show you how they were connected. Are you ready? All right. Firstly, here's the controller. Let's start from here again. So I'm not going to discuss those statistical pins anymore. I told you that this small controller, this system has an LED, an indicator. This is the indicator. It does have an indicator. This is the indicator. Send the indicator. That's an indicator that comes out and goes. We'll discuss why the indicator is there. It has a display. This is very optional too. We'll get this out eventually. But I just wanted to see where it's tested. So that's an indicator and a display. So let's begin to talk on the other pins that are available and how those pins are used. Can I continue? Yes. Now, I told you that we have an indicator. Now, I cannot connect the indicator. I told you the indicator is powered by the controller. You remember I told you? And it requires just two volts. Now, I cannot connect the indicator directly to the controller like this. I can't do that. Reason is because the mount controller sends out five volts at 25 milliamp maximum. This light emitting diode requires just two volts at a maximum of 40 milliamp. So if I connect these two directly, the voltage on the mount controller becomes too much for the light emitting diode. And the current that the, mount, the LED is accepting becomes too much for the pin of the mount controller to supply. So I needed to bring in a resistor here to limit the flow of the signal of both voltage and current. So I would propose in my heart that, oh, I want two volts available to this guy, not five volts. So this resistor will help me keep three volts. Also, I don't want 40 million I'm giving to this man. I want either 10 or less than 10 million given to it. Say, I want 8 milliamps flown to this light emitting diode. How am I going to get the value of the resistor? Or how did I get the value of the resistor that did the job? I'll show you. All I simply did was I said voltage equals current over resistance. And how, you know this is also. Yeah. And how will be voltage divided by what? The current. The voltage is going to be 5 minus 2 divided by the current, which is 2 times 10 to the power. The man that tell me 8 yeah. times 10 to the power minus what? Minus, minus 3. three. That's going to be 3 divided by 8 yeah. times 10 to the power minus 3. What will that give? Some people are not in class. Tell me, Jerry. What will you give? 1,000. 1,000. Are you sure? So what I used here was 330 ohms. So at 330 ohms, I allowed at least more than 8 milliamp to flow there. Maybe around 8 point something or 9. Does it make sense? So that was how the mouse controller powered the light engine diode. Does it make sense? Did you see it? And that's how the light engine diode would come on and go off. Now, we'll discuss how the power contract turns it on and turns it off later, but just understand this is a basic electrical connection between the power controller and the light emitting diode. And that light emitting diode was connected to the pin 12 of the power controller, to its pin 12. That pin 12 is the pin we call the ROC1. I'm going to just get to that point too. Is the pin 12 of the power controller called the ROC1 pin? Also, 
also on this system is the display. Can I continue? The display. Before I so let me just quickly introduce the display and I'll show you how it is connected to the mobile controller. Can we do that with you? We have a display. The display we have is, is called a 20 by 4 LCD display. LCD is liquid crystal display. Liquid crystal display. When I mean 20 by 4, I mean it has four lines and each of the lines can accommodate 20 characters. So that will be 20, that will be 20 rows, 4 color. That is it? That will be 20 rows, 4 colors. Does it make sense? Can I continue? It will soon be true. I just need to just, you know, I, I promised why we were having a discussion to actually begin this program. Don't worry. I will explain all of the technical aspects of this. We'll give you a video. Then you can now see about what you want to discuss on the day of the first. Those are the only things you discuss. And if your supervisor for it is now send you back and say, what and what and what and what is this? I tell the supervisor, give me one hour. Go back to your laptop, watch the video, and then get the answer. And then go back and tell them. Yeah. Yeah. Lagos Brian is fine. Very fine. <laughs> 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 Thank you. I've been to buy it only twice. Actually, can I continue? Yes. And so, the display in question is this. It's called a light liquid crystal display. This is it's four lines can accommodate four characters. Uh, four lines can accommodate up to 20, 20 characters per line. Now, if you pick up a typical light uh, uh, LCD, any LCD for that matter, especially the alpha numeric LCD, so don't forget. It's not just LCD, it's alpha numeric. Alpha numeric, which means it can take only alphabet awards and numbers. It can't do display work. We have graphic LCDs. This is not graphic LCD. We have serial LCD too, but this is not a serial LCD. Hmm? Now, if you look at the pin on the LCD, you find 16 pins on the LCD pin. You know, when, 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 I, when I brought out the GSM module, I showed you the pins on the GSM model. Mm -hmm. But it does not mean that we use all the pins. I mean, we only use that we just have four, 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 four pins there. Yeah. What do you mean, four pins? Are we? Yeah, four pins. Yeah, four pins. The light emitted, the uh, uh, LCD has 16 pins. 16 pins. So I'm going to give you the, name of, the names of the pins. This, this, other, this information is all information that I just get on my I'll just give to you. I mean, for the sake of. So the P1, you have the VSS, you have the VDD, uh, you have the V, you have the ROW, no, you have the ROS, ROW, you have the EN, DO, D1, D2, D3, D4, D5, D6, D7, you have A, you have K. Those are the 16 pins in that. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. If you remember the mouse controller, I told the mouse controller has a pin called the VSS. Yes. Look at the book. Yes. Where did we connect the VSS to? Uh, the of that. Thank you very much. So the VSS of this display also went to the negative of our supply. Thank you. The VDD. What voltage did I say the VDD was? Five. Plus five volt. Yeah. Where did we get it from? From the voltage regulator. Do you remember? Yeah. That voltage also powers the display. So this gets plus five volts from the supply. Is it making sense? Yeah. You see why when you were asking uh, the voltage, once the voltage is available, it can be connected to the different components that need it. Can you continue or give me some time? No, no, no. I'll continue. I'll continue. Yes. All right. Now, you see this VD. 
is the contrast control pin of the LCD. It's the contrast control pin of the LCD. This pin is where you adjust how bright or not bright the LCD is. Of course, you know what contrast control is yeah. on display. This very good. The way the contrast control is connected here is, you know, we have a VDD line that's our plus five volt line. I mean, yeah. we have a VSS line, which we also call GND, your grand pin of your supply. Do you remember? Yeah. What we did was we had a variable resistor to this place. The control of the variable resistor was what we connected to the V. You know, I didn't tell you about resistors. I just mentioned the resistor here. This is a fixed value resistor. But this is a variable resistor. You know those volume control on your appliances? They have variable resistors. You call them potentiometers. This one is your 102. 102 is written on it. 102 is the same thing as saying 1 kilo ohms resistor. But this time, variable resistor. How did you get 1 kilo? Just take the first digit. Then, these two become the multiplier. It turns over 100. You get it? So this becomes ohms. Which is the same as ohms. 1 kilo ohms. Does that make sense? What if you see 502? What would that be? 50 times 500. Which is what? 5,000. Or 5 kilo ohms. Does it make sense? What if you see 103? Ten times one thousand. That's one kilo ohms resistor. Variable resistor. Does it make sense? Is that straightforward? What you are learning in a day, you want some people learn in a year. So it's good for you actually. Can we continue? Yeah. So the contrast control, look at it. Yeah. Got its pin from the control of the variable resistor connected between VDD and VSS. So as you turn this control, you see the effect of the brightness of the system or not. When we understand, I'm going to show it to you. As you turn, you see it's that very bright that you can't see the display, or very dim that you can't see the display, or medium that you can see the display without uh, the contrast. Those are what the first three things are used for. Can I continue? Yes. Let me quickly rush down to the last two pages. You see the word A. This is the same thing as the anode. Then the K. What do you think the K will be? Thank you very much. This man is an electronic engineer. What happened is that the light of the day that we call backlights. Backlights. If you do not connect this A and K, what happens is that you would only be able to see the the, uh, the characters on the LED on the light meter that was only in the afternoon. When it becomes dark in the night, you won't see it. They like the backlight on your phone. When you remove that backlight, then you don't see what is being what is being displayed. Do, do you get it now? Yeah. So the the cathode goes to your VSS, which is the negative of your what? Of your supply. That's where the K goes to. It's your cathode. Can I continue? Yeah. And then the A, which is the anode, it goes to your VDD. But this time it goes through a 100 ohm resistor. So assume that this was your VDD. Your plus 5 volts DC supply. You have a resistor and 100 ohm resistor that connects to the anode pin of your contrast control of the LCD. So if you look at, in the 16 pins that we have, we have exhausted five pins already. The VSS, the VDD, the contrast control, the anode of our backlight, and the cathode of our backlight. Can I clean? Can I clean?
Are we going to? We now have this <laughs> deal. Let me take this deal to D7. Your deal to your D7 actually had this point where characters from your mouse controller are sent into the SD. But there are two ways. You can send characters or information into the SD using deal to D7 or using D4 to D7. Do you get what I say? You can use DO to D7 or D4 to D7. The issue is that what you have sent once using DO to D7, you have to send it twice using D4 to D7. But you make use of less pin on the mouse controller, which is what we did. So instead of using eight pins of communication, we decided to use just what? Four lines of communication. I didn't make use of this pin. So I have just less pins to use on the controller instead of using eight pins on the controller for just communication. Your address is your set reset pin. Your RW is your read or write pin. Your EN is your enable display pin. These three pins, more like control pins, work hand in hand with your data line to actually send characters into your LC from your mouse controller. Now this is issue. What it means is this. You can set and reset the display. You can enable or disable the display. You can write to the display and that was read from the display. So you find the set reset go from one and hide a one to a zero and hide it to a low bit. You get the read goes from a 1 to a 0 or a 0 to a 1, depending on what operation you want to carry out. If you want to write, you, uh, you want to read, it's a 1. You want to write, you want to read, it's a 1. You want to write, it's a 0. You want to enable the display, it's a 1. You want to disable the display, it's a 0. So it kind of keeps changing that. Why you use your D4, D5, D6, and D7 to send information to the SM? On the mouse controller, on what pins were these seven pins connected on the mouse controller? That was I just want to show you. So I had to first of all explain, I mean, the pin assignment of the SD2 before I take you back to the mouse controller. So our mouse controller has what we call this pin RB1, RB2, RB3, RB4, RB5, RB6, and RB7. Your RB1 is your pin 22. This is your pin 23. This is your pin 24. Your pin 25. Your pin 26. Your pin 27. And your pin 28. So, by effect, can I continue? Yeah. The, your SCD RS of the SCD was connected here. The RW of the SCD was connected here. The EN of the SCD was connected here. Your D4 of the SCD was connected here. The D5 of the SCD was connected here. The D6 of the SCD was connected here. And your D7 of the SCD was connected here. That is how the SCD was connected to the mouse controller. So if you look at it, we already have one pin for the light emitting diode. We have seven for the what? For the LCD. And don't forget, we already have six used pins already. This has to three, these are input output pins. Can we continue? Yeah. Okay. Let me just say this quickly on the map controller. We'll soon come, we'll come back to them. Let me just, why I'm saying the map controller. Let me say this quickly. D4 
the channels. Of course, don't forget it's the mouse controller that controls those channels. We have channel one. Uh, still on the manual controller. Let me put it here. So channel one. Let me put it there. Right here. So channel one and your channel two were connected to your uh, ROC three and your ROC four the controller. And the ROC three is your pin fourteen and your pin. So if you look at it, our two pins that are being used by the channel or the load. Can I continue? Yes. I also told you, don't forget, let me use go for this. I also told you that for the C module. You have TX, TXD, RUXD. I mean, yes. and I told you that the TXD goes to the what? RUX, and the RUXD goes to the what? To the TX of the controller. The TX of the mouse controller, controller is your ROC6, and this is your ROC7, which is your pin 17 and your pin 18. So if you look at it, two other pins we use for communication. So if you look at it in total, we use how many input output pin now? This is seven, this is eight, this is ten, this is twelve. So we use just twelve input output pin of the what? Of the twenty-two that we had. Is it, is it, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. so we have how many pins left on use? 10 yeah. pins. So 10 pins were unused. Apart, don't forget, apart from this, no, it can't be 10. Okay, of course, yes, 10. Apart from the 6,000 pins. So all in all, you can say in the 28 pins, you only use 12 plus 6, which is what? You use 18 pins. And then 10 pins are used. Now, the thing is this in the market are 18 pin mouse controllers that we could have bought and used. 18 pin mouse controller that will have offered us the, uh, the 12 input output pin we desire. They are in the market. But the issue is that this mouse controller has more program memory than those ones because of the volume of codes that should be written for this project. Those 18 pin I say could not accommodate it. But why we chose a bigger controller that, can, that has more program memory? Does it make sense? So don't forget, I just have to just quickly explain this. We've talked about the same model before. Yes. Only two pins from the same model connect to the mouse controller. The other pins go to your power, which is your VDI and your VSN. Do you remember? From the same model. I mean, and I told you that the channel, when I was drawing the block, can you remember? The channel connects through what now? Do you remember what I told you? The channels from the mouse controller goes through something. There was something, the block that. Channels. Relay. A relay, thank you very much. So there is also a relay in this device or in this system that needs to be what talked about. Can I continue? Yes, please. Hope you're not getting bored. No, no, no. I just need to just make all of these explanations. This is important. Can I clear the board? Yes. Chris, are you there? Yes. You go. I apologize to my mom when he's back and to David for living too soon. Now, if you look at it, all we are talking about are technical issues. How they are connected one to the other. 
So, what about the relay? Let me show you what the relay looks like. When you go to the market and say you want to buy a relay, there are two properties of the relay that are of most importance to you. First of all, understand that relay has what we call coil and contacts. Relay has coils and contacts. The coil of the relay is not so different from the coil of any solenoid. Just apply positive voltage on one hand, negative voltage on the other end, and the coil is energized. Same thing for the relay. Except that in the market, there are 5 volt coil relay, there are 12 volt coil relay, there are 20 volt, 24 volt coil relay, and there are 220 volt AC coil relays. All these ones are DC, this is AC. When I mean coil, I'm just saying 5 volt is what is used to energize the coil, 12 volt is what is used to energize this coil, 24 volt is what is used to energize this coil, DC. But there are some that are 220 volt that what is used to energize the coil. But every relay will have a coil side and will require a coil voltage. Can I continue? The relay now have what we call contact. There are three contacts on the relay. You have the common, the one that is called your common. You can also call it the wiper. Then you have the one that is called the NOC, which is the Let's start with the NCC actually. NCC, which is the normally closed contact. And then we have the NOC, the normally open contact. So So see the relay as, as this. Can I go to you? Sir, so this is a common. This is a normally close contact. This is a normally open contact. You know the way the wiper on a car glasses? You know it has a rest point. Yes. The rest point is the normally close contact, where it usually is. But the moment you energize it, the moment you get it started, what happens? It moves from the rest state and moves to the what? To the normally open state. And then returns to the normally close state and go back. Now, the wiper of the car keeps going back and forth until it is rested and then it rests. For the relay, the moment it is energized, it moves from the rest state and lashes to this place. So which means, so see this as a relay that is not energized. Are you with me? Not energized. Now, see this as the one that is energized. Okay, this is a common, this is a normally open contact, this is a normally closed contact. So the moment it is energized, which means you give it coil voltage, the wiper moves from normally closed contact and lashes on normally closed So it moves from normally closed contact and lashes on normally closed contact and remains there okay. until you de-energize it again, then it returns to this place. Okay. It's like once you energize it, it just moves and stays. When it is de-energized, then it returns to a state and returns. Can we continue? Yes. So the question you'll be asking really is, and don't forget what I told you why I was introducing the plan. I said the coil as 5 volt DC, and as the contact as AC 220 volt life and neutral. Do you get it? So let me explain how that was done. 
how we use the relay to turn on AC, even though the AC, the relay is being controlled with the DC, and then the light comes on and then the light goes on. Let's see how that is done. Can I clean the board? Yes. Right. I know I'm just going to draw it, but let me just show you. I want to look at this. As when you have a source, this is your life, this is your neutral. And then you have a ball. See, this is a ball. And the ball has a life sign and a neutral tank. If you want this ball to come, what will you do? Thank you very much. Connect life to life. And do what? Connect neutral. Yeah. This bulb will come. You know, see light shine. And if you want to turn it off, either remove the life or leave it or remove the neutral. It goes off either way. But you see, when you call the average electrician, when you call an electrician to come and wire your house, what the electrician does so you can have a bit of control is this they will connect the neutral. Code. Sometimes they connect the life, sometimes they connect the neutral. And then they take this your life and pass it through a switch. Do you get it? And then it goes this way. So when the switch is open, the bulb is off. When the switch is closed, the bulb is on. When the switch is open, the bulb is off. So they give you a bit of control. It's such control that does not kill you. But you don't have to be the one responsible for putting in the wires and moving the wires. You just do this. Comes on, do it, and it goes on. That's what they do for you. Does it make sense? Yeah. This is also what we want to achieve. The load we want to put on requires AC. But this time, we don't want to be the one. Of course, it's, it's, it's automation. So we need to bring in things that can help us achieve those automation. But we don't have to be the one having to turn on the channel or turn on the channel. Imagine you are at work and you have to turn on the channel at home and you have to come back home to do that. That's what the system is to achieve for us. Can I continue? So what we do, this time, we just make use of a relay to do the same thing. So how does the relay help us achieve this? Hope you have this. Just understand that this is what the relay is coming to replace. This switch, this mechanical switch, is what the relay is coming to replace. Don't forget it. The relay is there to replace this manually operated switch. But the relay is what we have. It's a switch. But she, are you here? Yes, sir. Can I continue, Mr. Sam? Yes. How then does the relay do it? Let me show it to you. Can I continue? Yes. Right. So this is your power controller. As well, this is one of the channels. Say channel one. There is a resistor to a transistor. This is a one kilo resistor. This transistor is your PC547. Can I continue? Alright. Uh, don't forget, it's a transistor. So your transistor is going to have base, collector, and emitter. You know about this now? Yes. Alright. Now, this is going to be the relay. The coil of the relay. Don't forget from what I told you. The coil of the relay will require positive voltages, which is our plus 5 volts for this particular one we are using. And the negative side require negative. But you see, I am sending negative through this transistor to this place. So I connected the emitter of this transistor to my VSS, which is what? Negative of my own supply. The poison of the supply is already connected, the poison part of the relay, one side of the coil is already connected here. So this relay is patiently waiting for what? Negative to come on it. So that the 
the contact can switch. And how do I apply negative to the coil of this relay? I bias the base of this transistor. So I put sending a five volt from my controller to bias fully bias the base of the transistor. The collector of this transistor act like a like a straight wire, like another wire. The moment you bias the base, okay. how much voltage do you need to bias the base of the transistor? Simple, just zero point six volts is enough. But apply zero point six volts to the base of this transistor. The collector and the meter of the, of the transistor behaves as though they are what? Internally joined together. So that anything that is on the collector is connected to the emitter. Anything that is on the emitter is connected to the collector. The moment you take away this 5 volts here and you make this place 0 volts, this guy does not get 0 0.6 anymore, he gets 0 volts. And then that connection is lost. They now act as though they are not connected again. The moment you give it base voltage again, they lock up. So whatever is here, is sent through here. The moment you remove the base voltage, they separate again as though they are, as though they are, they are apart. That is what we mean when we say we use transistor as a switch. I consider. Who is getting a bit interested? Is he getting bored? Bored? Can I consider? Can I consider? Yes. Alright. So, understand what I have done. I've only used the mount controller as 5 volts or 0 volts, 5 and 0, to energize the base of this transistor so that the negative that this coil is waiting for can be given. Or we take. Do you get it? Now, let me come to this side. It's going to make sense now. I already told you that the relay has two sides, it has three coils. The common, the normally close contact, and what? The normally open contact. And I have a bulb that I need to turn on. And don't forget the bulb requires what? AC. And I told you that the relay is there to replace what? That mechanical switch, that manual switch. Do you remember? Yes. So, which means what I'm going to do is this. Assuming this is my source, that source that I told you about, where you have life and neutral. Don't forget from the beginning. Yeah. And this is the ball. From my source, I can take the neutral part of the bulb to the neutral of my source. It's complete. So what, do you, what does the bulb require to come on? In this line, thank you very much. That line, if I connected it directly to the bulb, what will happen to the bulb? It will come on, but I don't want to be the one to do it manually. I'm not going to connect that line to the common of the relay. I will now take the normally open contact and connect here. Okay. Let me use black so you can see it. So what happens? The moment this channel is energized and a 5 volt comes out, 0 0.6 gets to the base of this transistor. This transistor's collector that is already carrying the negative part of the recoil of the relay is taken to the VSS. And since the relay already has positive fiber, what happens? The coil is energized. And what happens when the coil of the relay is energized? The common, which is the wiper, moves from the normally closed contact and connects to the normally closed contact. And don't forget, the wiper is already connected to the world, to the life of your source. By applying that life of the source on the normally open contact that is connected to the life of the bulb, the bulb does what? Come on, already have your what? Neutral from the source. That is how the relay replaces that manual switch that you are going to do. And then the bulb comes on. If you need to turn off the bulb, it's simple. Just withdraw the fiber that this man is sending and tell it, please, off that channel. Send a zero there by turning the five volt to zero, which is on the mouse controller. What happens? The base loses its voltage 
and then there's an isolation between the collector and the emitter. The relay loses coil voltage, and the wiper returns to the normally close contact with the light it already has. The bulb already has no trap, looking for light, it loses light, and then it will That is how that automation is actually achieved. Tell me it makes sense. It does. It does. Yeah. You get it? Yeah. So this was just replicated on another pin. Don't forget the pin we said we are using. Pin what? Pin 14 and pin 15, mm -hmm. which are ROC3 and ROC4. So this was just re replicated. But well, something you should not forget, that because the relay is a coil, there needs to be a flywheel diode here. What do I call it? Flywheel. It's your 1N4007. It's called a flywheel diode. It is to protect the coil of this diode from sending back EMF into the supply. Don't forget, when the coil is energized, it stores some what, some charges. When you turn it off, you don't want those energy, negatively charged energy, return back into the supply. So you have this diode to help you to the block. Just add this replicated on your pin 13 or your pin 14 for channel 1 and channel 2. And then you have control over the bulbs that are there. I don't have to draw this on another channel anyway. Do I have to? So just replicate this for channel one and then for channel two. But don't forget on what my controller pin they are. Pin 14, 14 or 15, yes, 14 or 15. Which is your ROC3 and your ROC4. Yes. Can I clean the board? Yes. Yes. Sir. Can I clean. What else is there to talk about? What other block? Have we not mentioned? I think I know. We talked about the power supply, microcontroller. Thank you. Display, relay, relay, and then the indicates of the shadow. Yes. Yeah, Are Yes. So all those circuit diagrams. For each of those blocks are what is brought together to form that circuit diagram that I sent you. I sent you a PDF. So, yes, yes. Are you? Yes. So it's easier explaining them in blocks, explaining how they connect to it themselves, than just drawing all of them at once and saying that is the circuit diagram. So it's easier to explain them in blocks. Or if we were to get the whole diagram of where everything is connected together, is that possible? Because when you send to me, they just. Actually, they are connected. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, but if you see the way they are connected, I use nomenclatures, labels. Okay. If you look at the map controller, you're going to see this labels round like this with names in front. Names in front. If you look on the second, you're going to see where those names are connected. Did you see? Let me give you an example. For instance, look at this, your Q1. If you come here, you're going to see the Q1 connected somewhere around here. You see? Actually, eh, this was the method I wanted to use at first. But I've changed this method. I'm going to send you another circuit diagram. Okay. When, let, let me, let me, let me, just a little digression. Hmm? I'm not going to explain this in this class. I intend to actually explain this in another video. Usually, I told you that we are going to bring in a tone decoder. Yeah. When we're discussing yeah. that. when you call the GSM module, the GSM module already has a speaker point. Don't forget I told you about it, that's a speaker point. Yeah. You can tap that speaker point. And from that speaker point, you can send that speaker point into the input of the tone decoder. So that whatever tone you send is received by the GSM at the speaker 
and is sent into the tone decoder's input. So it is the tone decoder that then decodes the tone and send a binary representation of the tone to the microcontroller. So the microcontroller reads that. That is what I was doing for you before. That was why, if you look on the board, and this is sincerely, you're going to find the tone decoder there. It's called MT8870. I gave it the name, the yeah. part number. Yeah. This is MT8870. It's there. But you see, when we're going to be handing this device over, we're going to remove it. Because while I was, while I've done the board to accommodate the MT8870 to use the speaker point of the GSM module, I realized we can actually operate the system without using a tone decoder. The GSM module comes very fully packed, where you can enable tone decoding option in it. By enabling tone decoding option, you don't need to be reading a speaker input for tone. When a tone is sent to it, and I say tone sent to it, you call it, it needs to see the presence of a phone number. And don't forget, by the version of what we said, the phone number must be an administrator, must be an admin. So when it picks your call, it quickly goes and checks if you are an admin. If you are an admin, then it answers the call and then it waits for you to send it to a DTMF tone. Of course. The moment you hit any key on your keypad, the moment it picks it, any, I, I, I explain it to you. Once yeah. you press any key on your keypad, you can hear the tone from the other hand. That's simple as it does. So that's what we intended to do. Where the tone is now received from the speaker, from the speaker it goes into the tone decoder. The tone decoder now converts that tone to BCD or to binary representation. But I realized that really, you don't actually need the tone decoder version. So instead of redoing the board, I kind of just leave it like that. But just change the operation in time. And that's why we have the have a system that is more robust. More, more what? Imagine. Ah. More efficient. Can we continue? Yes. So, if the second thing we're going to talk about now will be how these operations were then set up in the system. Very simple. Don't forget that we said we are actually dealing with a microcontroller, which means the microcontroller, apart from the electrical connection to the other devices, it requires programming to be written in it. So, programming was where you were, I mean, where what was used. But let us give you a, like a quick overview of how the process goes. Hmm? A very quick one, and then we can test our and we'll call it today. Now, this is the controller. Hmm? This is your MCU. This is your C module. TXD to RDX, RSD to TX. This is what happens. The moment, I know there is a C module in it, the moment you call this device, the first thing this device goes to check is to check if you are an, an administrator. And that doesn't check if you are an administrator. It copies. Now, this is what happens. When the call comes in here, the GSM sends like a notification to the power controller module to tell it there's an information coming to me. The power controller has registers that we have declared. You can call it inbox. Call it save box, call it GSM box, call it anything, there's a box. Where all the informations that are sent to the GSM module are received into. Those informations are what then we are what we then process to tell whether it was a call that came in, whether it was an SMS. If it was a call, is that caller part of those we have registered into our database as admins? If they are not admin, don't treat any other message, discard it and walk away. And I got the call. But if that person has been added as an administrator originally, originally, what happened is that I'll treat that person's information as priority. So if it's a call, it's going to answer the call. It has calls for receiving call. It answers the call. You also will see that it has answered your call, it has picked your call. You can now send the detail to. For this project, we use key one, key to one for channel one, and key to two for channel two. So if you say a key to one, if the channel was off before, the channel comes on. 
If you send a kid to one again, if the channel was off, it comes on, or if it was off, it comes on, if it was on, it comes on. But every time the system picks your call and the DTMM tone is received, it aborts the call. So you don't even have to worry about, oh, I called it, as it picked, no. Once it answers your call and confirms that you are an administrator and it receives a DTMM tone from you, it aborts your call and, and works away. But if you do not send it a DTMF tool, which means you mistakenly just called it, say your pocket just mistakenly called it, you had an administrator. Maybe it was the last call you made. And then you just mistakenly called it, dial it again. It picks the call. It's going to wait for 10 seconds. If it does not receive a tone in 10 seconds, it aborts the call and doesn't do anything. But every time an administrator tries to operate the system, it sends the administrator a text message. So you get text messages like, oh, channel 1 has been set on. Oh, channel 2 is now off. Oh, I received a call from you, but no DTMF tool. So the state of the channels are not changed. <laughs> information like that. It, it gets to give information like, oh, so, 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 uh, administrator has, add, has added so, so number to the database. Now, assuming the five of us here are administrators, and we added somebody. Only administrator one gets those feedback. And that is for very serious and obvious security reasons. It's so that even if any of the admins have been compromised, to add a person that was not supposed to be added, who gets the notification for addition? The administrator one. So the administrator one can decide to even remove the person almost immediately. Do you understand it? Do you get what I just said? No. So the administrator one is still like a priority admin. The other four administrators can also do the same, but none of them can delete administrator one. Yeah. Only the administrator one can delete them, but none of them can delete administrator one. You get it? Yeah. So if the fourth admin, now, I mean, imagine you use the system and there may be an intruder, somebody want, just wanted to get access to it, and the administrator, the fifth administrator could not be the person, and say, come, this is how you you had a user. This is how you delete a user. This and he, he has a user. He, the administrator five that did that work will not get the notification that the person has been added. It is the administrator one that will get the information. And you can actually call the administrator a bit and say, why did you have this zone person? Why? And if he doesn't want to go through that stress, all he can do is do what? Delete that number. And when they delete that user, if the user that administrator five tries to control the system again or operate the system again, the system doesn't respond to him again. So only those that have been set up as the administrator, only those people can set up the system. But what code or what text message do you set to control the device? Let me, let me just state them for you. Now don't forget, we said that how the administrator is done via what? SMS. How do you have an administrator? So don't forget, we said administrator, the first administrator is set in program. Do you understand me? Okay. It's coded from the beginning. You can't change that administrator. You can't delete that person. Wait, Julie, the instruction for hardening users, for hardening admin, is hash hard, hash hard, underscore, the phone number. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Star the index intend to add a person to underscore hash. So for instance, if I want to add my number, I simply just say hash add it's not case sensitive. If I write that way, underscore zero eight zero Nine double three zero three double six star index two underscore hash. I can it, and it can tell you it's going to return an SMS to the administrator one telling that person so 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 phone number 
essentially been added to the database into index so so and so number. We're going to get all those details as well when we test the system. If you need to delete a user too, don't forget you do that through via what? SMS. Simply just say hash DL underscore the phone number star index underscore hash. And when I do delete the number, I simply just say hash DL underscore zero eight zero two nine double three zero three double six star. It was added to index two. So you can put index two underscore hash. Now this is the D. The priority is not the phone number, it is the index. So what it means is that if you even type in a wrong phone number here, whoever is in this index will be taken out. So the priority is where? The index. <laughs> For the delete. Now, if I decide to change it eventually, I want to make sure that the number matches with that index before it carries out that operation. But I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I think it's something I should do. I didn't do that. So that if the phone number you, <laughs> you requested to delete does not match the phone number in that index, then it doesn't delete it. Alternatively, there's not even need for even bringing in the phone number. Just put in the index. But I'm just saying, with what I have done so far, the index is a priority. Which means if this phone number was wrong, this index will still be deleted. The index is priority. Uh, if you need to request for the state of the system, that is state of the channels, the way to do that is also very simple. Just say, do that by saying hash SYS system states hash. So I send this as SMS hash SYS underscore states hash to the system that's the same number in the module. And it confirms that you are the administrator. If an administrator, a non administrator makes this request, it's not going to respond to him or her unless him or her has added him or herself as an admin in the first place. Now, the reason why it's easy to make, I mean, to make a video around this that could be public is because there's no way they would know the phone number or the SIM number that's not being in the phone in that moment. Do you understand? So, even if you know how it is controlled, but you don't know the same number in it, then you can't carry out the operation. Does it make sense? Yeah. Can I continue? Yeah. So this is how you re request. So if you look at it, you request the state of the channel, and it replies you with an SMS. So tell you, oh, channel 1 is on, channel 2 is off, channel 2 is off, channel 1 is on, or both channels are off, or both channels are on, you get an SMS. You had admin, so you had admin, SMS 2. This is how you remove an administrator. Interestingly, the remove can also be replaced. Yeah. Which means, instead of saying delete, you don't need to delete, just overwrite a number for at, at an index. Just say add a different number to that index, and then it replaces the number there. Does it make sense? Yeah. So it's the same thing. Then we send it gets feedback, so we get SMS feedback. It's two channel, don't forget your channel. But how do you control the channel? You call it's via call. You call the phone number in the device. The call is received. You have 10 seconds to send in a DTMF tool. If you don't, it aborts your call and sends a notification to the administrator administrator to say, come. A call was successfully made. And that call was made by an administrator, except that no determined tone was sent. So the state of the channels are intact and not changed. But if within 10 seconds, after the call is picked or has been received, you press either button 1 or button 2 
for channel one and channel two. Every time you send this button one, it changes the state of that page. So which means it is place was that whole when we say you get a toggle effect, actually. You don't know a toggle. If it was off, you're on. If it's on, you're off. If it's off, you're on. If it's on, you're off. You can't on and on again, or off and off again. It's double again. You know what you mean by So which means, based on the state of channel 1, when you send the determinant to the 1, the state of channel 1 changes. Based on the state of channel 2, previously before you receive of a valid determinant to, the state changes and an SMS feedback. So you find the system of praise boats in SMS mode and call mode. The, the call mode works closely with what? DTMF, which means you have to send in a, a tone. And tone is sent via your keypad using the line number one or the number two. At the end of this video, if you need us to change this number, it can be changed. And if you need this pattern, for operation for your project specifically to be changed, it can also be changed. Do you understand? It doesn't have to, I mean, we're not going to do this again and do it this way. It will definitely change. But this makes sense. Yes. Understand? Yes. Any question? No. no. So, what should we do now? Uh, we'll ask it. No, I mean, what next thing? Next thing should be to test the system. Yes. And don't forget, we said this never as what? Memory recall. The implication is that when either the channel is on or off or whatever, and you turn on the system, when you turn on the system again, the first thing it does is to go and read this memory, and then return the channel to their default state that is saved before it does every any other thing else. So it does not forget. It can remember. Interestingly, the EEPROM memory in the mouse controller can actually store information for up to 40 years. 40 years? Yes. How large is the memory? Uh, how large is it? 256 bytes. No, no, no. No, no 256 bits. This one is more than 256 okay. bytes. Okay. Let me show I think it's 1024 bits. What it means is that if we have up to 1,200 channels, this power controller can keep their location, individual or independent of the individual locations, and keep them and remember them every time. So each channel op occupies just one of these locations. The other channel occupies just one of these locations. But this particular power controller, what power controller is that? The PIC 18M2620. As 1023 a problem location. Now, each location is 8 bit wide. Don't forget that. Each location, each a problem location is 8 bit wide or is, is of 8 bit size. What it means is that 8 bit in digital electronics, if you convert it to decimal, in between 0 to 255, which means you can write 0 in any of the channel, 2 in the channel, 3 in the channel, 100 in the channel, 200 in the channel, 255 in the channel. But you cannot write anything above 255 in any single channel. Interestingly, your characters, your African American characters, are also 8 bit size. So if I need to write sound, I'm going to need 3 in from location to store sound. 
because S we only occupy a channel, a location. M we occupy a location. M we occupy a location because each location is eight bit wide. But if you were to put in numbers, you can put between zero and two hundred and fifty-five as a number, an integer number, in either of the shadow or any of the shadow. If you have three hundred, you can save three hundred in the shadow. It's like having different account in a single bank or a vote, but your vote has size. You can't keep in a vote more than the size of the vote itself. Share your understanding. So, that, that. Okay, you want to say something for Okay, I wanted to ask about the... The programming the language. language. Yeah. Yes. Can we continue? Yeah. I <laughs> maintained it. We were not studying this already, have you? Yeah. And they said the digits. They are single digits. Oh, yes. The problem we're discussing is just four digits. Uh, I mean, we make it just two. Can we make it even two? Okay, we'll see about that. I, I started the work on Monday. Mm, yeah. yeah, I started the work on Monday. I was here on Monday. And I sat the Monday in the evening. We we're through. Then we, then we began to now begin to, to look at the code. I mean, it gives quite a lot of challenge, seriously. First was I discovered after Monday that the approach I was to use, which, that's the approach of bringing in an MTT70 was like a long route. So I had to go this way. So I had to change what I was, had written previously for this. I had to just change it and then begin afresh again. I did that into Tuesday, we began to test. We tested all throughout Tuesday, it was working, some part of work, some part of was being worked through Wednesday and even into this morning. At the point, it stopped giving feedback. I mean, we were receiving feedback on some operations. Then I stopped feeding on some other operations, like when you had user, it actually had the user, but we don't get feedback for who was added. But interesting, the user is there. I felt, no, what if any of the administrators become, I mean, gets sabotaged and added the wrong person that shouldn't be added, and give, it's like giving the person the key to the house. As, an, as the first administrator, you should be able to, and how do you send the person out? Change the lock. <laughs> or just delete the person that are trying So when and if you don't get notification that a person has been given an, a, a right to access the system, how do you change the person, change the person, or delete the person, or even modify, or, uh, modify the person's access? And I saw that that wasn't happening. I had to just and just just rounded that up a, 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 a while ago. Okay, the language that was used. Now the truth is, Mac modular can actually be programmed in several languages. Interestingly, you should understand that we are using the PIC map. It's by micro -shape. It's why the part number is PIC 182620. Because it's a PIC map controller. They are ATMIL macro controllers. When I mean macro controllers, I mean the IC. Now, you see this morning when you came in, you said, oh, you thought of using an Arduino board. And I said, why would I use a board? When the board has other secretaries or panels I don't need. I can't solder. Sometimes I need to actually now use the point wires to lift up. I mean, this is a design. It should meet any standard. It's a system that should be used and should not give you any issue for the next, for as long as it's operational. And I mean it. So, to, to have or give it his own board will be something of a, of a seriousness for, to me or, or priority. It's why I had to actually make its own board. See it. It has its own board intact. The relays, is relays connected the stamina blocks, the voting regulators, the mount controllers, the the uh, the SCD, the, uh, uh, the SCD, and the rest of it, and then. The lamp holders to hold the lamps. So it's compact. There is absolutely no way I could have used and did not actually achieve this because the board is already made. I have to be using the point where I have to get them out. Does it make sense? Yeah. So this is an installable board. 
You can actually just even just produce this board alone and have this sold as against a, 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 a binary robot and replicating that. Sure, you understand. Now, for for the for the PIC power controller, the PIC power controller can be programmed using uh, uh, assembly language. Assembly language. It can be programmed using uh, the C language. But you should know that this C language is a manufacturer dependent. Because there's ITEC C. There's ITEC C. Then you have the CCSC, which is the one that I use in your program. Then you have the microchip C2. Actually, uh, you have the, the micro C. The micro C has two variants you have the micro C and the micro C Pro. Are you following? Yeah. So, but of course, it will not be out of place to say you see language. You can also use basic, basic language, and even Pascal to write, uh, to write. But that were not the languages that we use. C language was what we use, and the C language that we use was by the CCS. The CCS. It follows the NSIC standard format. So C language is used. Are you following me? Yeah. Now the environment where it was used is in the CCSC environment. Why the circuit diagram was drawn using a, a, a simulator called Proteus Isis. I'll show you all of that. Proteus Isis was where the circuit diagram was drawn. And then, but the code was written in the CCC environment. And then, the result of the code, the result of the code, after it was compiled, files were generated. A core file, a dot core file was generated. That was what was added to this Proteus Isis to simulate the project, to see how it was going to work. Are you with me? So even before we go ahead and began to plant the board, we would test and we use our core card and our core credit to do all of the work. We already know if it was going to work or not. Now the fact that it simulated does not mean it was going to work. Of course, it was simulated and working fine, it was not working in real life. Programming English. That we had to actually take our time to look at, we come with and then solve. But of course, if it works on Proteus, 10, 20 percent chances that it was going to work in real life. Of course, that's very slow. Yeah. Very slow. And then, but the board, the PCB board, the way you saw that board, that board also was done. Please get one of those PCB there. The board was done, the PCB design was done, or was drawn on the same Proteus, but this time on the Proteus carries. I don't know how to say can get from So the PCB design was drawn also on Proteus, but this time on Proteus Iris. This is an example. Okay, this is an example. This is how it comes when we are done with the PCB. Then what we do is that we go to the printers with a photo paper. And then we transfer all this. I mean, the, this image is transferred on this paper. And then what we now do is that we now get our copper board, like you saw. Then a copper board. You know, it's a copper board. What you have in the yeah. copper board? Then we transfer that image on the copper board. Um, how do we transfer? We are on it. Oh. We iron it, we, that's, we place it on the copper board. So I zoomed in the copper board, we place it on the copper board. 
plain iodate. But since this paper has a glossary surface, yeah. it transfers. You remember that gun that you don't usually play with? Yeah. I put something like because that's a glossary surface, so can, the image can be transferred. Right? So it's like an image transfer process. Okay. So the moment it's transferred, all we then do after is to drill it, etch it, put it into an etching chemical. This is what the etching chemical looks like. This is what the chemical looks like. Of course, this is what it looks like after it has been used over time and it has begun to oxidize, and it has oxidized copper. Mm -hmm. It's actually white. But as the oxidized copper begins to turn there. And then, so we do the etching, we do the drilling, then we then begin to plant the components of it, and then we do the soldering. That's, that's actually the process of making the board. You know that so don't forget, programming is a C, originally in the CCSA environment. Why the circuit design was drawn on proton ISIS? The board, PCB design, printer circuit board design was done on proton ISIS, and then was taken to the printer to print, was transferred iron on the copper plates, dripped, etched. Component planted, it's sold out, and then it's tested. Any more question? No. Now, so we can test the system now. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much.